Well, thank you. Morning, church family. Hey, this morning, <clears throat> the, the sermon title, you can see it there on the, on the, the overhead here, is Showing Hospitality. <clears throat> Excuse me. Building a Loving Christian Community. It's a sermon that I endeavor to preach at our home church at least once a year, at least every year. Um, and you'll see why as we go through it. But we, in your Bibles, we're mainly going to be looking at a few passages, some in, in Romans 12, 1 Peter. Um, and so we'll be just be flicking through it, and I'll lead you to those passages as I call them out. When you think about the church, and then what the Scripture says about the church, there's a lot of metaphors used to describe it, right? In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, Paul describes the church as a field where God's word has been sown and watered and the growth is you. God has caused you to grow in faith. He's given you new life and you are growing in Christ. Likewise, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 also, the church is described as a building where Christ is the foundation. Ephesians 2, 21, the church is described as a temple in which you are the dwelling place of God in his spirit. Ephesians 4.12 also describes the church as the body of Christ, where Christ is the head of the body. But my favorite description of the church, my favorite metaphor of all of them, is the church as a family, which is why every time I get up to preach, I greet the church as good morning church family, because that's what we are. We have been adopted by God through Jesus Christ to be his own children. At the moment, as a church, we're going through Ephesians, and we looked at that a little bit in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5, and it's just an amazing understanding to know what God has done for us in adopting us as his own. He's our heavenly Father. And when you read through the Sermon on the Mount and how the Lord taught what it means to trust Christ, what it means to trust God, to follow, to trust in Him. You notice that always Jesus spoke about the Heavenly Father as His Heavenly Father, which is true in the relationship that Christ has with God the Father. But He's also mimicking it to us, describing how we are to relate to God as our Heavenly Father. We are therefore the household of God. We belong to Him. And you read that in 1 Timothy 3.14 and Ephesians 2.19. And especially in 1 Timothy, where Paul is talking about how the church ought to behave, how it ought to conduct itself, he makes pains to say, because we are the household of God. We belong to God. And there's an honor and a privilege and a grace in that that should be evident in the way that we live our lives and the way that we, we conduct ourselves and the way that we treat one another. And so as a family... Like any other family, we are to love one another. The Apostle John makes that very clear. You can turn with me here to 1 John chapter 5. <clears throat> if you don't know the book of 1 John, John gives evidences to, to give assurance to you that you are indeed, you have eternal life, that you have salvation. <clears throat> and one of those evidences is that you love that you love the brethren even as Christ has loved us. And so John says here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. We, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Notice what John says love involves. Love involves keeping God's commands. There's an objective standard to love, which is a great contrast to the world today. Because the world talks about love as this kind of nebulous thing that can never really be defined and somehow love embraces all and accepts all no matter how immoral or moral it may be, but there are moral standards to love. And so you see here, love has these objective standards that's in the commands of God. We have the supreme example of Christ's love and that he laid down his life for us. And when we see the love of Christ 
and him laying his life down for us, we see that love is defined as the giving of ourselves in order to good to others. But that good is defined by what God sees in his word. The good isn't what I say it is. It's not what you say it is. The good is what God says it is. And he defines good by what he commands. And one such commandment in Scripture is the command to show hospitality. So if you were to do a brief reading of those passages, if you looked up whatever search engine you have, or if you have an old-fashioned way, what I do is a concordance, and you'd look up the word hospitality, you would see that all those passages where the command to show hospitality, they reveal that it's an important part of the Christian life. It's an important part of everyday fellowship within the family of God. It's a qualification for eldership to show hospitality. It characterizes widows who are to be honored in the church. It expresses practical love for your fellow believers. Hospitality enables evangelism. It's just talking to to someone in the, in, in the hall about having people around through this disaster, bring, coming around and showing hospitality to them and, and obviously through that, sharing with them the love of Christ. Hospitality also aids discipleship and fellowship. And so hospitality and the modeling of hospitality are essential to the Christian life. Have you ever thought of hospi- hospitality that way? It is essential to the Christian life to the life of the church. And so I want to show you this morning that hospitality is key to building a loving Christian community. It's key to building a loving church family. You will have long-standing members in this church, in this fellowship. You will also have new members who are coming along. And the, one of the best ways that you can get to know one another and which you can build your affection for one another is to show Hospitality. And so, because it's a command of all of us, it isn't the responsibility of a few, it's the responsibility of everyone. And it isn't a matter of giftedness, it's just a matter of obedience to what God has called us to. So, what I want to do this morning is I want to give you two key insights and then a handful of tips to encourage hospitality. In your own life, or if you're already showing hospitality, hopefully this will will cause you to excel in showing hospitality. Okay, so two key insights and a handful of tips to encourage hospitality and to excel in it all the more. And so here's the first way. Here's the first key insight, that hospitality is a practical way to show love. Hospitality is a practical way to show love to one another. In almost every command in the New Testament to show hospitality, it's always in the context of showing love. So look with me in Romans chapter 12, verse You see there he says, contribute to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. There's the call. Do you remember at the beginning of this chapter, Paul is urging us as believers in view of the mercies of God, which he's kind of outlaid in chapters 1 all the way through to chapter 11. He's spoken about the mercies of God and how we should therefore not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed through the renewing of our minds that our lives should be lived differently. This transformation involves having a Christ-like or Christian love. And so in verse 9 and 10, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And so there in the context of showing love for one another and serving one another, Paul says, listen, be hospitable to one another. And you see this again in 1 Peter chapter 4. In 
And there in verse 9, he says, Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. But look what comes just before that command in verse 8. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. So there again, we see this command to show hospitality in the context of, of loving one another. And then again, if you come back to Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 2, <clears throat> Likewise, and he says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. But again, look at verse 1. Let love of the brethren continue. So again, showing hospitality is in the context of showing love to one another. And that, this idea of letting love continue it means it's to persist. Let your love for one another persist. And so throughout these commands, there are two words here used to describe love. It's the agape love, which you know. We see that in Romans 12, 9 and 1 Peter 4, 8. This is the, the sacrificial love of God demonstrated towards us in Christ, Romans 5, 8. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so here, in a sense, if you think about the gospel, is the, is the ultimate example of hospitality, Right? That God in his love sent his son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. So that through Christ, God would adopt you into his own family. That he would welcome you into his own home. Not just for a time, not just for a meal, but for eternity. And we sung about that today, looking forward to that time when Christ will return and he will transform us into the likeness of his body and we will be with him forever. Where? In his heavenly kingdom, in the new Jerusalem, in his home, in his father's house where there are many rooms. And so we see the love of God demonstrated in the greatest display of hospitality and welcoming us into his family. Then you have another term, um, Philadelphia. Philadelphia, which means familial love. It's a family love. It's kind of the, the, the affection that you would have within your own family. And because as believers, we are all a part of the family of God, we are to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's more than, it's not just a sacrificial love. There is a genuine affection and care for one another. And so Pauline says, summing up these words, our love is to be without hypocrisy. We are to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. We are to be fervent in our love for one another. We are to persist in our love for one another. 2 Peter 1.7 says we are to grow in our love for one another in a very practical and tangible way to do this is to show hospitality to one another. Hospitality is love in action. It's both personal and it's sacrificial. You think about it. You give up your privacy and that you open up your home and your family to invite others in. And they get to see where you live and how you live. They get to see your family interact. You give of your time in preparation for your guests to come and stay or maybe they're coming uh, just to have a meal. But you also give of your finances because it costs, right? It costs to have people living in your home or it costs to, to have them over for a meal. And so the giving of yourself, the giving of your time, the giving of your money, when you show hospitality, are real demonstrations of sacrificial love. As one author noted, quote, hardly anything is more characteristic of Christian love than hospitality. Through the ministry of hospitality, we share the things we value most. Family, home, financial resources, food, privacy, and time. In other words, we share our lives. End quote. Amen? We do, right? It's the giving of ourselves, of everything we have, to show good to others. 
1 John 3, 16 to 17. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Or to reverse it, when you see your brother in need, whether it's a physical need or a spiritual need, and you bring them into your home and you share with them what you have, the love of God in you is displayed for everyone to see. And so the first insight is that hospitality or showing hospitality is a very practical way to show love. And your home is the ideal place in which to build relationships, to build closeness of relationships, and it helps build a loving Christian community. It helps build a loving church. Well, here's the second key insight that hospitality is. It's a proactive way to serve in ministry. Hospitality is a practical way or a proactive way to serve in ministry. As we read through those verses, in almost every one of these commands, not only is there a close link to loving one another, but there's also a close link to your spiritual gifts and to ministry. So come back again to, to Romans chapter 12 and verse 13. Remember what he said, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. But if you look in verse 6 of chapter 12, he says, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to each, uh, sorry, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. In verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. If you know anything about your spiritual gifts, they are for the benefit of who? Who, are your spirit, who is your spiritual gift for the benefit of? Of God, but also who? For others. Yeah, God has given you a spiritual gift with the intention that you use that gift to help and to edify and to build up others. So 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 7. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things and all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For the common good. And so here you see again hospitality in the context of loving one another and of loving one another and using your gift to minister to others. And you see this even more closely in First Peter. See if you come with me there again to First Peter chapter 4. And we'll read in verse, actually let's read from verse 7. Paul says, The end of all things is near, therefore be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint, as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So the end of all things is near. What should you do? Pray, love one another, and serve each other through the exercising of your gift, and be hospitable. So again, there's this close connection between the exercising of our gifts and hospitality. I think sometimes when we, when we think of spiritual gifts, we think of their employment in a corporate sense. So for example, on a, on a Sunday morning, those who have the gift of teaching might teach on a Sunday morning. Um, they might preach the word of God. Some people might serve in the music ministry, on the sound or in data. Some people on the welcoming team. Um, some people serving in the morning tea. So we think of it in that way. Or sometimes we might think of using our gifts in what I would call formal ministries. There's the youth ministry. I serve in the youth ministry. Or there's a Sunday school ministry, the structured ministry on a Sunday, where, where I teach the kids about Christ or... 
Maybe it's, uh, it's other ministries that you have going. I don't know if you have boys rally or, or whatever other ministry you might have during the week. But the kind of formal ministry, structured ministries. But there are only so many positions for those, right? I mean, not everyone in the church gets up to preach. It's only those who have the giftedness to preach. Not everyone can serve in Sunday school. Not everyone can serve on on the morning tea roster. But when you think about it, there's an answer to the solution of how we can all serve, and that's what I would call informal ministries or ministry relationships, where ministry is happening not through structured forms, but in the context of your own home, when you bring people into your home and, and provide hospitality. And there in your home, you minister and you exercise your giftedness to them. Whether it's encouragement or teaching, you might share with them what you've been learning about the Lord and you might encourage them with that. You might have the gift of mercy. Someone may be discouraged or downhearted and you you bring them in for a meal and for a time of fellowship and and, in your mercy, you you love them and you encourage them and, and you alleviate them of the things that are concerning them. And so hospitality is a way in which you can exercise your spiritual gifts to benefit your brothers and sisters in Christ without kind of some sort of formal structure. And this is where the work of service can be done in the building up of the body of Christ. In fact, I would say it should be done more so than anywhere else. Alexander Strauch in in his book, the Hospitality Commands, and, and if it's just a little book, I, I would recommend it to you if you could buy it, buy that book. But he says this, Perhaps you, like many Christians, want to know what you can do for the Lord or how to use your spiritual gift. Your home is the ideal place in which to start serving. You can invite people into your home for prayer. You can reach out to new people at church or in your neighborhood. You can help believers get to know one another better. You can provide lodging for divided families. You can show appreciation to teachers and your leaders by inviting them into your home. You can be the home away from home for singles living on college campuses or serving in the military who may not have even a home-cooked meal in weeks or months. Many people need the ministry of hospitality, end quote. At GBC, when we have new people coming to the church, we would have a newcomer's lunch, we'd invite them in. And oftentimes you want them serving in some way, and there are a lot of practical ways they can serve. Again, Sunday school, we have this ministry called More Than Craft, or a girls' rally, boys' rally, um, the morning tea roster, the welcoming team. There's all manners of ways practically they can serve. But the one thing we ask them to do first is like for the next year, just have people in your home. Just show hospitality. Get to know the people in the church. Let the people get to know you. And as you do that, you'll get to know what the needs are. And you'll be able to minister to those needs and pray for those needs and encourage those people. And so showing hospitality is a practical way to show love. It's a proactive way to serve in ministry. If you're looking for a way to serve at at OBC, and I don't know all of you, but if you are and you haven't found a place, then I would encourage you to show hospitality. Begin there. And, I, and as you do this, the result will be a body that will be built up in love. You will be contributing to a, a loving church family. So those are the two insights, the key insights. So I want to give you a handful of tips on, on uh, showing hospitality that are, that are really practical. So there's five of them, because it's a handful. It makes sense. First, husbands. Husbands, it's your responsibility to lead your family in hospitality. It is your responsibility to lead your family in hospitality. You say, where do I get that from? First Timothy 3.2 is one of the qualifications of an elder, which is he is to be hospitable. Which means the implication is the husband is leading his family in showing hospitality. Now, husbands and wives work together, obviously, 
But the husband is to make sure it happens in the home. And the wife is the one that ultimately makes the hospitality what it is, right? With, with, with the way that she makes her home a home. Um, I don't know whether husband and wife cook, however it happens. But the key is, husbands, you have to lead this. You have to ensure that it happens in your home. And you might say, well, my wife doesn't like hospitality. I'd find that hard to believe. And shame on you for blaming your wives if that's the case. But however it happens, you need to make it happen. Right? You're, you're, you're talking and praying with your wife, and we'll look at more of that. Listen, if you have children, showing hospitality is a massive benefit to your, to your children. And I'll tell you why. They get to serve alongside you as parents. Right? You, can, you can get the kids to help, you know, depending how old they are, obviously, you know, to set the table, to clear the table, to do dishes, to, to hand out coffee or, or whatever it is. The children learn how to serve others, right, as they watch their parents serve and minister to their guests. Your children are seeing you serving people, and so they learn how to serve just by watching you. They also see the genuineness of your, of your love for other people as you love them in your home. I think one of the things that, that kids will struggle with growing up is whether they see a consistency in their parents going to church, their faith at church, and their faith at home. Well, when you bring other believers or people into your home and you love them and you minister to Christ to them, your children see the integrity of that. And so they see the genuineness of your faith as you love people in your home. But not only that, they see the genuineness of your love for the church, which is a genuineness of love for Christ. You can't separate love for Christ and love for his church. They go together. And so when they see you loving the church family, they, they know that you love Christ. Man, my mum and dad love the Lord because look at the way they love the people of God. So, so husbands, you need to lead your, your family in this. You need to make sure it happens. Here's a second tip. You have to plan hospitality. You have to plan hospitality. Uh, Romans 12, 13, again, says practice hospitality. Uh, the word practice means to pursue, to seek it, earnestly. I don't know about you, but that doesn't really imply doing things off the cuff, though you can. But you need to practice it. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality, which is easy to do, right? When you're in a difficult situation or when it's really, really busy. Like when life is super busy for you, who has hospitality at the top of their mind? Right? You probably want to get home and just rest and relax. The last thing you might want is to have people coming over and to minister to them. And so to pursue hospitality and not neglect it, it implies a deliberate conscious endeavor. You have to plan it. You have to be purposeful. Proverbs 13, 4 says, The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the soul of the diligent is made fat. So he's not questioning the desire the desire to show hospitality, it's fine. The difference is, if you're a sluggard, it's not going to happen. If you're diligent, it will happen. So unless you plan into your schedule a regular time to show hospitality, once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, you'll never get past the good intention level. Because the busyness of life will just crowd it out. You'll think, next Sunday, next Wednesday, next week. Next month. And so in this particular era of your life, you'll be a hearer of God's word and not a doer. And so you, you want to plan hospitality. And I don't need to tell you how to do that. Just plan it. Ring someone up the week before and say, hey, how about this Sunday you come for lunch? Yeah, that's great. And then you've had a really tough week and Saturday's been really tough. And Sunday, you wake up not feeling good in church, and you're thinking, oh, man, I wish we hadn't invited those people around for lunch because I'm so exhausted. You might feel like that. But you've planned it, and you purpose it. Here's the third tip. So husbands, lead your wife in hospitality. Plan hospitality. The third is pray. You have to pray about your hospitality. 
First Peter 4 9. Be hospitable to one another without what? Complaint. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. The biggest enemy to showing hospitality is selfishness, to which we're all prone to, right? And as I've said, when you've had a really super busy week, the last thing you might feel like you want to do is to show hospitality to someone. So, But Peter understands this, he knows this, and he says, listen, show hospitality without complaint. Maybe someone has an urgent need and they need a place to stay. And it might be really inconvenient for you to, for them to stay for a week or however many days. But Peter is saying, listen, show them hospitality without complaint. Complaining promotes disharmony and discouragement. And so you need to pray that you'll have the right attitude when you show hospitality. And that attitude we see in Philippians 2, 3 to 4, where Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. And then he gives Christ as the perfect example, whose humility was seen not only in his leaving, his thr- leaving heaven and becoming a man, but submitting himself to the point of death and even death on a cross. But it's that just the humility of mind, the considering of others above yourself. And you might think, well, Jesus is God. He is above everybody else. In what way did Jesus think of us as better than himself? Well, he served us. When you think of someone better than yourself, It means you see yourself as a servant to them, to serve them, to minister to them. That's what it means in the context that Paul gives here in Philippians. So if you want to grow in your hospitality, you have to pray about it because it is a spiritual battle. Having people in your home will be a spiritual battle. And so you, you pray about it because we do battle with selfishness. Number four is make hospitality about ministry. Make it about ministry. And in saying this, I'm not saying you can't have friends over and enjoy whatever, a rugby game or something like this. It's just making your home the primary place of ministry where you love and care for people, where you minister to people. A place to love, a place to serve, a place to provide fellowship for others. And so you might invite new people in the church for a meal. You might invite with them some established members in the church so they can get to know one another. Um, There might be those in your church who are going through a tough time. So you want to invite them into your home. Uh, There might be those who are single, uh, young adults, who could always use a good meal, I think. I know when I was young and single, we used to try and invite ourselves around to people's houses. And... um, Widowers, widows, inviting them around. You want to get to know people, get to know their families, get to know their relationship with the Lord, get to know their spiritual journey and walk. Um, single people too, I want to remind you, there are single people here. I'm not meaning to ring red in. Um, if you're single here, you can still show hospitality, right? You're not exempt from this. You can show hospitality. It might be inviting people around and saying, hey, let's have a potluck at my place. Or, or you might invite people around and you might, you might be a great cook. I don't know, you're a great cook? Sorry, not looking at me. <laughs> you, could be, you could be a great cook and you might serve up a meal. I mean, I had a, when I first became a Christian, I had a friend who, he was a chef. And so that's what he would do. He would invite people around and, and he would cook. And, uh, and then one time when I had a flat and I had a neighbor and, and, and he was an unbeliever and wanted to minister to him, I invited him around for a meal, and then I invited my mate around so he could cook the meal. <laughs> but there's just ways you can get around. There's ways you can do it, right? Serving together. So I'm just saying, if you're single, you're not exempt from showing hospitality. If you have a home, if you have an apartment or a flat or somewhere, or you live with a bunch of guys, um, you can show hospitality too. You are not exempt from this command because you're single. So there's plenty of ways that you can do that. So again, 
Your home is a perfect place to minister to people. It's a perfect place to share the gospel with people. It's a perfect place to show love and to get to know the church. Um, again, evangelism, workmates, neighbors, family, your own family. Bring them into your home. Your home is just a natural place to be able to share the gospel, to build relationships with people. Well, here's the last, the last tip. So it's husbands, lead your family in hospitality, plan your hospitality, pray about your hospitality. Um, what's the fourth one there? I'm waiting for the tip. Make hospitality about ministry. And here's the last one. Make hospitality simple. Make hospitality simple. Um, we grew up, my, I think my parents, and my dad's passed away now, but they were really awesome at hospitality. But they were in a day where it was a roast. And so mum would put the roast on in the morning, it'd be set the timer, we'd come home from church, you know, and there's this beautiful smell of roast wafting through the kitchen, and we'd have this massive meal. Um, if you've grown up in that generation, hospitality doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be that elaborate. If you want it to be that way, that's fantastic. Um, but remember, it's more about ministry than anything. And so it could just be something simple as, as having sandwiches, right, or fish and chips or pizza, um, however you want to do it. Um, I remember we, when we first came to a, a church in Hawke's Bay, um, when we um, had been somewhere else and we come to this church and these people invited us for a meal and it was off the cuff, it was last minute, but they were always deliberate in doing it, and, and they just brought out sandwiches. They just brought out bread, butter, peanut butter, jam, some cucumber, and we just had that. But it was just a great time of fellowship, just getting to know each other and, and talking. Um, one time there was a family, when we were living in the USA, they were newly married. They just had a, a small, tiny apartment, right? And they invited our whole family, all seven of us, over for a meal, and I think some of us sat on the floor. But again, it was just a simple meal. But it was just a great time of fellowship because the focus was ministry. So when you're showing hospitality, it doesn't have to be elaborate. It doesn't have to be full of airs and graces. It just has to be simple and just make it about ministry and loving people. In his book, The Hospitality Commands, which again by Alexander Strauch, I'd highly recommend he describes hospitality as the missing jewel in the crown of Christian life and service. I've never been in a church where this jewel was missing. Maybe it needed a bit of polishing, but it was never missing. Listen, we, we can't underestimate the vital role that hospitality plays in building a loving Christian church. It was a prominent feature in the early church. And with the busyness of today's world, it's so easy to become a missing jewel. And we don't want it to be that. First Thessalonians 14, Paul urged the believers to excel still more in their love for one another. And since hospitality is a practical way to show love, let us excel still more in showing hospitality to one another and in doing so, build a loving Christian church to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, let's, uh, let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we do just thank you for your hospitality. And for Lord giving us Christ, making it possible for us to be reconciled to you, making it possible for us to be a part of your family, to be welcomed into your home, to be part of your kingdom. And so, Father, we thank you for the tremendous love that you've shown towards us. And we pray, Lord, we would show that same love towards one another in the body of Christ. Lord, the hospitality that ministers to each other, that loves one another, that serves without complaint. Father, may there be hospitality that reaches out even to the communities here, especially after what's happened in regards to the, um, the flooding Lord, may they receive the love of the church in this way, in hospitality, being invited into homes and ministered to and cared to and, and for them to be listened to and ministered to, to be shown mercy and grace and love and, and wisdom and kindness and 
So, Father, we again pray that there would be an opportunity to, to share the gospel and minister to people around us. But, Lord, in all things, we pray that, Father, it's your love that compels us, your love for us, your love for one another. And, Lord, may we again show that love to each other in this way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much.